chapter, Acts chapter 1, from verse 7 to 8. And he said to them, it is not for you to know. Obviously, when you read the scripture, it's a continuation of what's been said. So if you, want, if you don't know the reference of it, please, you may want to go back and look at it. But this is a discussion which Jesus was having with his disciples. And he said, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. What that means, what he was saying, he was purely talking about the fact that it's not for you to say, oh, uh, I want to know exactly what will happen or this or that. You may have a range of ideas. You may have the understanding of that season or see the signs, but it is not for like James and his brother that say, ah, we want to sit on your right side when the, end, when the end comes. It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. You know, because the secret things, the Bible says, belongs unto the Lord. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. In the mighty name of Jesus, each and every one of us will receive fresh power in the name of Jesus. A release of fresh grace, fresh grace of the Spirit in the, in the mighty name of Jesus. It shall fall upon each and every one of us in Jesus' name. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witness. Someone say witnesses. Witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the, the old King James. I know I asked for any King, new King James, but I'm just saying it sometimes for emphasis. The old King James says, and to the uttermost ends of the earth. We'll come back to that. Let's jump quickly to Acts chapter 2, verse 14 to 19. I hope someone is timing me. And I'm trying not to move away from the pulpit because, you know, I, 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 I don't want to fall short of the time today. It's a very short exhortation. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk. This was when, you know, they, 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 they were now manifesting the move, move of the Holy Spirit and they were speaking in different tongues and different languages and they could all hear each other. He said, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass. And it shall pass even in our own time right now in the name of Jesus. And it shall come to pass in these last days, says the Lord, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. A good place to say amen. amen. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and, f blood and fire and vapor of smoke. These two scriptures are so linked to what we are celebrating today and marking today. And that's why I've titled the message today, Witness Internationally. That, that E is, you know, with an apostrophe. Witness International, if you want to call it that, but if you want to call it with the accent, is Witness Internationally. What does that mean? Where am I going with this? Like I said, I believe God that we are all meant to be witnesses for Christ. We are all meant to go forth and be the voice that will speak even to the world out there. And we're celebrating International Day today. Indeed, it's a good time for us to think about the area of witnessing what we have done. But I want to thank God especially again for our children in this church. Our children, our children indeed have progressed. They have progressed and we can see from uh, in the children's church, they are being taught on evangelism for a 12-week program. I, I don't know what number of weeks they are on now, whether it's eight or seven. Anybody can just shout it out if you know. They are on this 12-week program. They are challenging us as adults that these, these children who are having this program of this uh, witnessing, some of them have come home to you and they've shared with you what is being taught. They have progressed. They are progressing. And indeed, God indeed is using them more and more. But it's using them to challenge us. In the last days, your young men shall see visions. You know, we are seeing it happen. Your sons and daughters will what? Prophesy. We are seeing it happen even in our own time, in our own church. 
But guess what? It does not mean, the Bible did not leave us out. Jo Joel did not say that the adults were left out. He said even we, the adults, we do what? We will dream dreams. So we still have the ability and the potential and the capability to dream. May the grace to dream fresh dreams, may it not die in us in Jesus' name. Our children have progressed and they are progressing. The teachers, we thank God for them that they continually you know, teach them. I believe our children particularly have so much matured in the sense that I think of the time of COVID. They went through the COVID, they were taught, they knew to do online, they, they, they went on those things, and we could see the impact of how that they've trans transformed and, you know, prom they've, been, they've been improved from one level of grace to another. The challenge today to you and I is what about us adults? It's about time that we do not rest on our words and think oh, our children are doing it. That prophetic word that Joel said, because the reference for that Acts chapter 2, verse 14 to 19, is from Joel 2, 28 to 32. Joel made those pronouncements that this is what will happen. And so when Peter was speaking here, it was, it was actually you know, recounting what Joel has said. And dare I say that I stand here today on the, on the background, on the platform of this word, recounting what Joel has said, what Peter has said, and what God is saying to us now. In the mighty name of Jesus, I say in these last days, the Spirit of the Lord shall be poured upon all flesh. In the name of Jesus, our daughters, sons and daughters will prophesy. Our young men shall see visions. Our old men shall dream dreams. In the name of Jesus. And upon every main servant and every maid servant, in the name of Jesus, each one shall prophesy to in Jesus' name. God will do a new thing in our midst. Praise the Lord. As I um, want to look into what we're going deeper into tonight, uh, this morning, I want us to know that if you look at the world at large, look at the nations, look at what's going on around you, and I thank God for everything that's been said today because it's all in sync. You do not need, I do not need, we do not need anybody to prophesy to us that we are in the last days. We truly are in the last days. The signs are written. Everything is there all over for us to see. We can see signs of wars and rumors of wars all across the globe. We can see how the war in Ukraine alone has affected the whole world. Not just affected by hearing, it's even affected our what? Pockets. So much so that we are now all crying about increased cost of living crisis. One war. Imagine if there's two of that. Imagine if there's three of it. We are in the last days. So let everyone watch out his faith. With, uh, watch out his faith with fear and trembling. Praise the Lord. I've not come to scare us, but I've come to wake us up. To realize that we cannot just, you know, take it lackadaisically. With all the strange happenings that is occurring across the world. Strange climatic changes, seriously unheard of, are being debated and being protested about daily. I can go on and on because the kind of things that we are seeing and the kind of things that we have heard, they are the things that should shake us up. Generally speaking, there are six major types of climates across the world. And there's not one, not even one, not half, not one of these six major types of climates that spread across the world that has not been affected. I start with tropical. We know what tropical countries are. They are supposed to be hot and humid where the world's rainforests are found. But we all know what's happening to rainforests these days. There's, there's lots of fire that is taking up all the rainforests, and they, we are realizing that there's deforestation that's happening in a way that shouldn't be happening. Uh, may the Lord have mercy on us. What about arid lands? We have the arid lands. These are dry climates that you find in deserts, areas that are in a proper desert. Recently, I don't know if you've been listening to the news, we heard that in Sahara Desert, Sahara Desert, which is the, de the world's driest desert, had a snowfall in the midst of Sahara Desert. Now, these are signs for us to know that things are happening. The next one is the Mediterranean. Usually, Mediterranean climate is hot uh, um, and dry in summer and cooler and wetter in winters. The cooler, we, we wetter winters are fast fading because I recently found that out when I went to Greece that no, we are, they're having much more drier you know, uh, summers compared to having uh, wetter and cooler winters. That's three climates already. 
What about the next one? The temperate climate. This is where we are in UK. And many of us can truly identify with this. That where we should be having mild summers and winters that are not too cold, we know that our mild summers are no longer mild. For the first time, our summer went to 40 degrees this year in United Kingdom. These are the signs of the end of times. I know everybody can wish it away and say, oh, it's climatic change. Oh, it's ozone layer. But there are certain things I don't want to go ahead of myself. We need to think of what is happening. We need to look around. Six climatic conditions in the world, and each one is no longer the way God originally intended it to be. The fifth one, continental. Continental, these are areas with long, cold winters and short, hot summers. Countries like the northern Ukraine or Russia or Belarus and all those places. The fruit of the matter is when there's war going on, who remembers climate? They are going through so much problem that even whether it is cold or it is hot or whatever, you know, so you can see that those areas are no longer the way that they used to be. And the last one is the polar regions. The polar regions are areas that experience long periods of extreme cold, like the Greenland, like Iceland. But you and I, we know that daily we keep hearing that the, uh, po the um, Iceland and that the polar region is what? Melting. It's melting, it's been on the news regularly, and we're hearing it day and night. But I put to us today that these things are not just for us to hear and just say, oh, it doesn't affect me. Let me just continue to do my work. I need to make money. I need to make this. These are the signs of the end of times. Let's not just explain it away. Let's not put it to, oh, let some climatic people go and fight for us on M25. When they fight for us on M25, they will block you and you will stop you from getting to where you're getting to. So they are fighting in the way that they know to ought to fight. But we as Christians, what should we do? The Bible says, clearly tells us, that we should be like the children of sons of Issachar, who understood the signs of uh, signs of the times and seasons. How much more can we talk about the change in the climatic situation right now? Do we understand why it is going on? What are we going to do about it? What is our role as Christians? Are we supposed to do something? Are we supposed to get up and act? Or are we supposed to just look and wish it away? It's not going to be wished away. And the truth of the matter is, we cannot. We are, we are, which planet are we going to go? We still remain in this planet. So whilst we are here, we should do what we ought to do to ensure that the will of God is established in Jesus' name. These are the end signs of the end of times. That's climatic situation. What about strange things? Things that we never have heard of. Things that if you hear, eh, you will cringe. That is this happening? You know, recently I was traveling on, uh, um, on the tube and I read a word on it. I don't know whether anyone of you has seen it. I'm demisexual. So I'm wondering what does that mean? And I went into the, uh, to check it out. They just, thought, they just have to coin a word for something. When you say you're demisexual because you don't want to go into sex, you want to, to see the person's personality before. New, new coinage of things just to make it look like there's something somewhere that is happening. But the original intention that God did in the Garden of Eden has still not changed. We hear things about bisexual. We hear things about non-binary gender. There's someone that we always make a joke with. Oh, which which gender are you identifying with today? Maybe I'm half male or I'm half woman. And maybe I'm identifying as a tree. When God created you, male and female he created, he didn't create you as a tree. So may the Lord have mercy. Because these are the sign of the end of times. We have polam uh, polamory and bestiality. Polamory means, pol uh, maybe I'm not pronouncing that properly, but what polamory means is it's not even polygamous. It's about you can have as many sexual partners and as many sexual you know, spouses, whatever, in the same relationship, in the same house. So five of you can be living. So you can be, can be having relationship with three. Another two. Be having, so nobody knows who is anybody. So if anybody even gets pregnant, who wants the children? It's a polamory child. May the Lord have mercy on us. God indeed is looking and is, the list is endless with the things that are going on. You think, oh, it's only Western world. Go to Nigeria. They're talking about bestiality. Women sleeping with dogs. Things that before if you hear, you say, hey, I don't want to say my language. Uh, it is well. You say, God forbid. This should never have happened. But these things are happening because these are the signs of the end of times. And so in line with the scriptures that we just read earlier on, I think it only makes spiritual understanding for us to know that what the Spirit of God is expecting us to do. 
We cannot be like those who do not have a relationship with Christ and just think, oh, let, let everything just carry on. We've been admonished by Prophet Joel that in the last days, the Spirit of God will be poured out, out on all flesh and sons and daughters will prophesy. And they're still prophesying and they will continue to prophesy. I don't know how many of you heard recently about a young man, young black man, black British, young who speaks not like the way I speak, speaks proper English, proper British accent. And uh, he prophesied this very change that all of us we are going through right now. You can go and Google it on YouTube, or Google it or go on YouTube, you find it. He prophesied that in this country in UK, that we'll be having a non-Caucasian prime minister. And he did not, he, he said it. He also prophesied many things about Brexit. But you see, he doesn't carry a lot of names. He doesn't carry a lot of highfalutin. Everybody is talking about him. Because it's not what we call the fathers of the faith. But God is doing things that will shock each and every one of us. He's raising up young sons and daughters that he will speak through them. And it's important for us to be sensitive to know them. Some of them may be in our own very midst. Some of us, we are supposed to nurture them. Some of them, we are supposed to guide them. If you go and listen to the things that young man said, you think, wow. But if it was one man that carried a title or carried a whatever, everybody will be worshipping him. They'll be saying, oh, whatever he said is true. Ah, we have to follow whatever he says. But you see, God is working discreetly and is looking in a way working the way that you least you and I will least expect because God will not share his glory with any man because if it's one man that we all know that we all say ah this is a citizen man of God it is a general of God who we'll does it is the general will be looking at not to God but you see may the Lord not pass us by may the spirit of the Lord not just cringe and come out in our midst and we still did not know the two disciples were traveling on the road to Emmaus they said ah so Jesus was there, and we knew it's not. May that not be our portion in Jesus' name. Because these are the signs of the end of times. God did not necessarily use fathers of faith even to do things that he's planning to do right now. I'm not saying he can't use them, but I'm just saying he didn't necessarily do that. But the, the, the prophecy is so spot on. Now please bear me out. May I, let me just put a caveat. I'm not here to promote prophecies of uh, you're wearing color blue. You're wearing color green. Your telephone number. Those are not those are not prophetic things. They are occultic things. I'm talking about someone and people who are in tune with the spirit of God who will tell you what they believe God is saying. And they will say it humbly and you can sense it's palpable that what they're talking about is from God. So please let nobody leave this place and then go and say, ah, prophet, please tell me what's going to happen to me. What food am I going to eat tomorrow? That's not prophetic, to be quite honest. That's not what God is calling prophets for. Let's see how prophets operated in the Bible. And let's stop this mumbo jumbo nonsense. Sometimes because of our culture, as African culture, or background of black culture, or whatever, we like to see soothsayers. Somebody will tell us what will happen because we are going through situations and circumstances. And sometimes if something is, is, all, is all shrouded in the name of Christianity, in the name of religion. Pray for me. Help me check what is happening. There's nothing happening that you yourself cannot know. Pick up the word of God and the Lord will speak to you and the word of God that you know it will what set you free praise the Lord so let's unpack what we have said for a moment and I'll just few minutes and I'll stop let's unpack it for a moment we read Acts chapter 2 and we, and we also read Acts chapter 1 but I'm going to focus on the Acts chapter 1 now because having known that the Spirit of God is upon all flesh and these are the end times and we can see the signs, we know the signs. But it tells us, it reminds us that in Acts chapter 1, verse 8 that we read, that we shall be witnesses, when that spirit of God is upon us, we shall be witnesses to him in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost ends of the earth. Four categories. And I'll speak and I'll stop. The first category, Jerusalem. My dear brothers and sisters, on this International Celebration Day, many of us want to think of the uttermost ends of the earth. But what are you doing in your Jerusalem? What, who are you witnessing to in your Jerusalem? Who is your Jerusalem? Who is my Jerusalem? Have we identified the people that God has sent us to? 
the scripture is not written. Our pastor always says it. There is no mistake in the scripture. He will say it and he will repeat it so that you can know the number of two, the number of witness. Make sure that it is sound. Two, uh, you know, one will chase a thousand, two will chase two thousand. Doing this is in the power of two that you see that there is that witness, there is that confirmation. So this word is true that God in this we shall be witnesses to Him, starting from Jerusalem. My Jerusalem, your Jerusalem, dare I say, is your immediate contacts on a regular basis. You may want to write that down. People you see every day, day in, day out, your friends, your family, your schoolmates, your workmates, your neighbors, your unbelieving friends, but you see them day and night. We all have a responsibility to witness to them and to pray for them too. This is part of the 12-week, I believe, I, don't, I haven't read the course content, but I'm sure that's part of the 12-week training that the children are being given even in the children's church. But for us today, let us start to know. Let's visit our Jerusalem. Let's think in our immediate circle. When last did I even speak to this, my brother? He has said to me, oh, this is your church, church. And so therefore you've given up. But this, it sometimes it's not only in speaking. When last did you pray for them? When last did you pray for that son? When last did you pray for that cousin? And you keep seeing them, you talk about every other thing but Christ. He says we'll be witnesses to him in our own Jerusalem. On this international day, if there's anything any of us is taking away, say, Lord, help me to be able to speak and witness you in my Jerusalem. Now, how do we witness? Do I go to say to them, you're going to die if you don't give your life? You are, no, 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 that's not witnessing. That's just creating fear and havoc. Just share your story. Tell them the experience you've had. Tell them how God delivered you. Tell them there is something God has done for every one of us. When last did you share that story? Or you think, ah, you put that story, you put that testimony, you put it in the corner. You're looking for the next one. And you're praying, God move. God, the last time you moved, what did you do with it? Who did you share it with? Start with your Jerusalem. Begin to speak. Don't say, oh, I've spoken, I've spoken, I've spoken. You keep speaking, but in the last days, God will arrest who he needs to arrest. As you open your mouth, God will touch them. In the name of Jesus. That's about our Jerusalem. What about Judea? Judea is our acquaintances. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Some will say acquaintances, some will say acquaintances, whatever you got the gist. People you, you don't necessarily have close relationship with, but your paths continue to cross now and again. A friend of a friend that you occasionally see, your shoemaker, your, uh, your hair dryer, your dry cleaner, your barber for men, you know, all of those people that you, it's not that you see them every day, but, but they are, uh, maybe I should stand corrected because some people visit their barbers almost three times a week. Hallelujah. Especially with this modern uh, hair, hair trimming, fresh cut, fresh cut. So maybe your own barber will move to your Jerusalem. No problem. Whatever it is, just witness to them. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Those you acquaint yourself with, get into discussions with them. Not just about the latest celebrity. Not just about the increased cost. Ah, this increased cost of living crisis. Ah, it's going to kill everybody. It will not kill you minus me. You know, those, those things that you say, you're in the saloon or whatever, and you just begin to join everybody because everybody is saying it. Before you open your mouth, Holy Spirit, what should I say here? Because the word you say will touch somebody's heart, will encourage somebody. God has made you to be in that place because there's a purpose for you to be there at that particular moment. The steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. You're not there by accident. You're not there because you just want to look good. Sometimes you go because you think you want to look good, but God wants to look even better. God wants to look better through us. He wants the things that we say and we do to glorify his name. So begin to think in your area. When was the last time? You spoke, my shoemaker, God bless him. He was so, I, I felt sorry for him because it was like things were going from, you know, one calamity to the other. And I said to him, at the end of the day, you can't change anything. All you can do, all I know to tell you is that God is the only person that can help. And they've, they've shut his business down. They've said his business cannot increase because they can't pay the money. He didn't get COVID money. He didn't get this. I just told him what Christ, now poor plants, Apollo waters. But God gives the increase. Don't say, oh, I'll speak to him, nothing will happen. As you have sown the seed, God will use somebody else to water it. So go forth and just sow the seed. My dry cleaner is starch Muslim, but he's a lovely man. I love him to be. The other day we were going for a party, and uh, the, the clothes have been sent, both top and bottom. I, when I, when, what, what do you mean? What do you call trousers? So for bonds of a better word. And he forgot to send 
to give the trousers when we went to collect. Hey, it was about 20 minutes to the time. And what happened? I just called him. And you know what? That's how close the relationship is. He put the uh, trousers in a cab straight so that, because I wasn't near home, he brought it to where we were so that we could use it. That's the kind of, there is nothing, one, one of them says, ah, I was about to give up last week. But I remembered what you said. Ronke said, there's no point dying. When you die, what else will you get? So I keep fighting on. Now, has he become a Christian yet? No, he hasn't. But he's on the pathway to becoming a Christian. So your, the people that God is bringing your path, don't close your mouth when you get there. Don't shy away to say that you're a Christian. You don't have to carry a placard. Though. You don't say, hey, here comes a Christian. Hey, if you, the other day, I was walking in Romford, and you know this powerful... Praise the Lord. If you don't give your life, you will die. This is the way. I don't know. Excuse me. I don't think those things work. Because the people you are shouting at, especially in this uh, Western world, people don't like to be shouted at at all. Even your children will tell oh, you're shouting, you're shouting. Because we Africans, we shout. Some of us, we have megaphones. Natural megaphones. <laughs> Mercy, Lord. But that's how God created me. So I'm not going to shy away from it. Hallelujah. But I'm going to use the voice positively. I will not use it negatively. So some of us have naturally high voice, high, vo high volatile voice. So when you don't start shouting, you're going to hell. You would, ah, in fact, people run away from you. So those are not the best ways to witness. Now don't just criticize them. What are you going to do instead? Begin to, this is not about criticizing those who are witnessing in that way. But what are you and I going to do differently? You've talked about Jerusalem. You've talked about Judea. Let's go to Samaria. Which Samarians is God showing you? Who are your Samarians? Samarians are the strangers, but you have been able to reach them just for a privileged moment or an opportune time. People who don't necessarily have your faith, but you can share the story of your faith or your experience or your journey. This can be your Uber driver that you will never meet again. It can be someone in the hospital that you will never meet anymore. It can be someone on a long queue for an appointment in the bank. It can be somebody you are both sitting in the GP surgery and you are waiting because GPs can take three hours for one hour appointment. That is a good time to witness. It can be someone on the plane, recently on the plane, there was a young man sat beside me. He was going, oh, hi, babes, hi, babes. Oh, I thought, oh, you, you think you don't want to have babes? Me too, I have a ball. It's so... <laughs> But you see, the joy of it was being able to share with him that I have a happy marriage. He's, I was happy to share that. What made my marriage happy is because Christ is the bedrock of my marriage. 33, he said, wow. So he just thought maybe it's high babes, high babes of uh, one year is what's going to make me shake. By the time I finished speaking, he said, wow, I want to be like you. I said, come along, no problem. Christ makes the difference. It's important. I may never see him till I die, but he remember somebody told him that Christ made the difference to make the marriage last. There are different different ways of, of, of witnessing. Don't let us just think it's only one solid, one rooted way. The Samarians got, Jesus Christ said, I must need go through Samaria to go and rescue that woman that was at the well. Who is our most needs? Who is your most needs? Who is God showing you that this is the most needs that you must, not me, but you must witness to? That Uber driver, that, do you think it was just an accident? There was one Uber driver that blessed me. He's a Muslim. He blessed me. And I prayed for him. A fellow sister dropped their card, bank card, in the car. And he did not, she did not even know because she was going through some other stress at that time. The Uber driver called the sister and said, oh, what can I do? So I said, ah, and I'm not here. Just come to the office. Let me call Pastor Ronke and give her my card. Ah, the man came home. In fact, when he first pressed the door, nobody opened. But by the time we opened the door and spoke to him, my, uh, one lady I took, she said she comes to this church. She said she found, oh, I said, God bless you. I said, this is the church. We serve God here. I know you serve God too. I prayed for him. I said, the God that I serve, it will show you wonders. This week, your Uber business, it will progress. You know, there is something that you can deposit. These are people that are Samaritans. They just, you do not even need to know them or need to see them anymore. But you have deposited something in them. And as you deposit, if we all keep depositing here, a little here, a little here, a little here, a little, one day, you will know, ah, ah. 
who are all this bunch of Christians? I will give my life to Christ. That's how it works. May the Lord use us mightily. May we become witnesses international. Not just ones that will sit in our own corner and be concerned about cross of living crisis and be moping and be mourning. You know, the more you give, the more you reach out, the more you are blessed. The more God increases you. The more the, more the Lord opens the doors for you. May God be able to use us more mightily in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Lastly, who is the last group? The uttermost ends of the earth. Where our pastor is right now. When you want to go on crusade and speak to multitude of souls. And as you're, as you're standing on the altar and you're preaching, you're seeing demons fall, you're seeing demons uh, uh, cringe. You're, the disciple says, ah, master, hey, we saw devils, we saw demons doing what? Falling like lightning. Those kind of things happen at the uttermost ends of the earth. And some of us are in that category. I'm saving money for the day I will go for the mighty crusade. I'm saving money for the day I will go to the uttermost of the earth. I'm saving money for the day I will go to Ghana. Start in your Jerusalem. Don't think until the day you have money to go to Ghana before you can witness. Start in your Jerusalem. Use your Judea group. Use your Samaria connection. And then, surprisingly, it can even be somebody within that Samaria group that will give you money to go to the uttermost ends of the earth. For with God, nothing is impossible. When Philip, the eunuch, uh, Philip, uh, Philip, the apostle, met the utopian eunuch, God transferred him. He, he had a, in those days, they had not started those kind of uh, uh, exportation um, aeroplanes that would transport you. He had what we call only spirit transformation. He just, from there, he was escorted from to another place to go and minister. May the Lord use you and I mightily. May the Lord indeed, as we avail ourselves, may the Lord open doors for us. This international day must not go empty. Our children are doing a great work. We adults must do better. Our young ones shall see visions. And we, our adults, as adults, will dream dreams. Begin to dream a fresh dream about your Jerusalem today, about your Judea today, about your Samaria today, and then about the uttermost ends of the earth. As I'm speaking, I'm looking at one of my wonderful mothers. A dream is the day she will step on the shores of Ghana and say, yes, I have made it. And I believe God with her that she will not die without seeing that dream fulfilled in Jesus' name. I know she loves to serve the Lord. And I know the things, these dreams that you carry, that you're pregnant with, God will do it for you. But you see, there are times that because we, we, we're longing for those big things, and this, this Jerusalem one's giving us problems. We can't abandon it, you know. We cannot. We just have to continue. The Lord will grant us grace. He will grant us strength. He will grant us wisdom. He will grant us courage. He will speak through us. The words that we will speak, himself will pronounce it. This international day should not pass without us desiring to have a fresh awakening about witnessing to the world. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord increase us mightily. As we rise up right now, I want each and every one of us, if you received something of the Lord today, something that touched you, something that, you know, would struck a chord in you to make you realize, Lord, there's much more I can do. What is it that you've not done for me? That brother, oh, I could have spoken to that person in that taxi. I could have spoken to that person on that plane. I could have reached out to my barber, to my hairdresser. This week, I'm going to do it. This month, I'm going to do it. This year, God will use me for greater impact. We have been talking about deeper impact, greater impact. These are the ways in which we can impact. And guess what? God is the God of all man and all flesh. He will go ahead of you. He will go ahead of us. Don't even reason how you're going to say it. Because he who has put a word, has put a desire in our hand, as we speak it, there will be answers in Jesus' name. There will be solutions in the name of Jesus. And you know the best thing out of it all? Because some of us may think, oh, this woman is so she came to talk about today. I brought problem here, but your problem is solved. Because the Lord that we serve is a seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and every other thing shall be added. Someone is receiving a blessing today. The the minute you have received a change of heart, a change of attitude about the desire to say, I'm going to witness, God will prosper you, God will increase you. I stop at this as a testimony to use it because I'm not just saying it. This is the life I live in. When I was pregnant with our firstborn, it was so bad that year. 
He was bleeding upon bleeding, bleeding upon bleeding. But you know what? One of those occasions when I went to the hospital, there was a lady in the next room. She was five months pregnant ahead of me. And they were trying to bring out the dead baby. She was, you know, when they do that, they have to induce her and give her medication. You're not in labor, but they're forcing you to go through labor. It is one of the most traumatic things for any human being, let alone a woman, to go through. I brought my problem. I was there. I was saying, God, this 10th year, this, this pregnancy must stay. It cannot, it cannot, it can, this baby cannot just drop. But I cannot, because of my own pain, ignore what she was going through. Ah! Woman being labored to bring forth a dead baby. May that not be your portion in Jesus. I got up from where I was, where I was still managing myself. I knocked on her door. I said to her, are you okay? She said, ah, okay. What kind of okay? She screamed. It was there I ministered to her. It was in that Queen's Hospital. No, King George's then, I beg your pardon. It was in that King George's. I prayed with her. I said, this one may have gone. I'm not going to try and do gymnastics and say, oh, the baby will come back alive now. This one may have gone, but God will do the one that will stay. I serve a God who is able to do. Do you know I was still believing God for my own baby after 10 years of waiting to come through and I still had the grace to go and minister to her. Such powerful ministration. God looks upon it. That woman, not only her, but she and her husband who was in the world for a few moments. Oh, where is Mrs. Sam? I've forgotten the family name. Yeah, it's called something. Very, very funny family name. They came, they joined the church in Eastern then. And they came and they had went on to have not just one baby, but two. Now, what am I saying? When you witness, now, did her own having her baby or having that salvation, did this stop mine? No. So don't think of me, I have my problems. I have things I'm doing. I don't have time to witness. I don't have any time. You remain more in that problem. But the more you give, the more the Lord will bless you. The more you reach out, there's a saying that he who opens up the hands will receive more. But if you close your hands, I have my problem. I'm forced. I'm frustrated. I don't have any money. There's nothing I can use. You're just adding more to the problem. And so may the spirit of this living God that is pouring upon each, us, each one of us today, may he grant us that desire to go out as fresh witnesses. Fresh witnesses for Jesus. Every opportunity we see in our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost ends of the earth, we will not shy away from it. We receive the grace, the wisdom, and the impact to do so in Jesus' name. And the church of God says, Amen. Praise the Lord.